Some years ago, I was at a youth retreat where they had now, a Q&A Now, one of the great session. questions that people God the Creator should be obvious by the If you were looking down or Jesus from all high lines of God the Creator, God the Creator, In the last segment, we talked a little bit about the vessel and how God works in preparing and selecting his servants. And uh, when we read the, about the first creation, we read how God formed it and then how he filled it. And then as we move on in Genesis, we discover that God does the same thing with people. He forms them and he fills them to accomplish his purposes. Now, one of the great questions that people constantly discuss uh, is the section in Romans chapter 9 where the Apostle Paul talks about the hardening of Pharaoh. And I'd like to make a few comments about this. We're not going to study it exhaustively, but I'd like to make a few comments about this passage regarding Pharaoh. The first thing to notice is the context. As we're coming through the book of Romans, it starts off explaining the dilemma of man that he is a guilty sinner before God. He can't be saved by works, can't be saved by law keeping, his own effort. He needs to be saved, he needs to be justified, that is judicially declared right by God uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus. And then he begins to talk about sanctification, that is not to be judicially declared right, but actually made right. And the same principles hold true. We can't be sanctified by self-effort, by our own works. We need to be sanctified by faith in the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, when he comes to the end of chapter 8, he says, uh, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you can just imagine the Roman believers who were Gentiles sitting there listening to this and saying, this sounds really good. But hey, wait a minute. What about the nation of Israel? Like, didn't God love them? And hasn't he cast them off and now reached out to us Gentiles? That's a good question to ask, isn't it? And so Romans chapter 9 introduces Pharaoh, not because the Romans are sitting there saying, hey, wait a minute, what happened to Pharaoh? They're asking about Israel, and Pharaoh is going to be used as an illustration of what God has done with Israel. And so we have this scene. It's the land of Egypt. The children of Israel are slaves. God sends Moses and Aaron into Pharaoh's palace to declare, thus says Jehovah, let my people go that they may serve me. And Pharaoh pompously says, who is Jehovah that I should obey him? And God says, so you don't know who I am, Pharaoh? Well then, let me show you who I am. And so begin a series of plagues, and these plagues are all designed to show Pharaoh and the children of Israel and other observers who this God really is, Jehovah. And he's shown to be superior to all the gods of Egypt. Now, in the story itself, the first four times that Pharaoh's heart is hardened, the scripture says it was Pharaoh who did it. He hardened himself against the Lord. Now the Lord was very sincere with Pharaoh. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. And he showed Pharaoh clear evidence, and, and Pharaoh should have bowed down and worshipped the Lord. But what did he do? He made a mockery of the, of the evidence. And he said to his magicians, Jannies and Jammeries, show them boys, you, you do what these fellows have done. And they made a charade of the thing. And God could have said, if that's how you're going to behave, that's it for you. But God's not like that. He's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. And so he says, in essence, Pharaoh, if you don't like my evidence, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you more evidence, incontrovertible evidence. So that the first round of plagues, it's Moses and Aaron who say, this is the true God. In the second round, it's Jannies and Jambres, his own court magicians who say, 
this is the finger of God. We can't do this. We can't imitate this. And still, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And so, the Lord then takes over the process, and he begins to control the rate at which Pharaoh's heart is hardened with the objective, as we read here in Romans chapter 9, it's God's purpose to make his power known and to reveal his name throughout all the earth, says verse 17. That was God's purpose. And he wanted to use Pharaoh as an example of someone who didn't know him and then came to know him and responded to the evidence. Now, the man who wrote this chapter was himself an antagonist to God. And he could well have said similar words. In fact, when he fell on his face in the ground in the dust on the Damascus Road, that's exactly what he said. Who are you, Lord? He didn't know who he was. And the Lord Jesus revealed himself to Paul. Paul responded positively to the message and he became a vessel of mercy. Now please notice that when we're talking about a vessel, we're not talking about an object of mercy or an object of wrath. We're talking about a vessel. A vessel is not a symbol of salvation. It's a, it's a symbol of service. And God wanted to use Pharaoh to accomplish his purpose. What happens when someone resists God's desire to use them for his purpose. They get hardened. They eventually get crushed, as Pharaoh did. But it wasn't God's intention for that. That was a choice that Pharaoh made. And God's hardening of Pharaoh was simply a catalyst to control the rate at which Pharaoh's heart was hardened so that God could reveal himself in these ten distinct ways. And the question might well be asked, how was it that God poured out his wrath on Pharaoh? Well, it's what we call the Passover. The most theologically accurate portrayal of the salvation that comes through the Lamb of God that can be found anywhere in the Old Testament. So here's a situation where Pharaoh hardens himself against God and as has often been said, no one's absolutely useless. You can always be a bad example. And Pharaoh, instead of becoming a, a vessel of God's mercy, receiving the mercy of God, God said, Pharaoh, you can reject my mercy, but you can't stop me from using you. I will still accomplish my purpose. And what I'll do is I'll pour out my wrath on you in such a way that other people will have me. You will be a warning to them to flee from the wrath to come. Did it work? I'll tell you it did. Forty years later, when the children of Israel get to the edge of the Promised Land, two spies go in to check out Jericho, and a very unlikely woman who ran a body house, a house of prostitution, in the city of Jericho, she grabbed them by the lapels and said, I want your God to be my God. Why? I heard what happened in Egypt. And hundreds of years later, when the Philistines steal the Ark of the Covenant, and then they start having their problems, they say, we better get this thing out of here. We remember what God did to Pharaoh in Egypt. God made his name and power known, what does it say? Throughout the world, throughout the whole earth. To this day, in hundreds of different languages around the world, in street corners and in uh, home Bible studies and from pulpits, there are people taking up the word of God and preaching the Passover the way God poured out his wrath on Pharaoh. The scripture says, in wrath, remember mercy. And that's what God does. The great judgment of God against the world in the days of Noah produced one of the finest illustrations of God's salvation in the ark and the opportunity to come into safety. And Peter tells us that actually it was the Lord Jesus who was preaching by the Spirit through Noah for 120 years, pleading with people to come. There is no rush to judgment here. God does not delight in bringing his wrath. But when people harden themselves against God, the question is, is God thwarted in his purpose? Of course not. 
he finds a way to use even their intransigence to accomplish his ends. This is an illustration of what happens in the subsequent two chapters when Paul is going to talk about the blinding of Israel. We're going to have to look at that in another session, but simply to say this, that the same holds true, that when Israel turns away from the Lord, the Lord doesn't turn away from Israel. He finds a way, as we read in Jeremiah, to make the vessel again. And God is using the Gentiles to reach the Jews in a similar way that he used the Jews to reach the Gentiles. So when we read this little section, uh, sometimes people will stop short of the punchline, and that's an unfortunate thing. There is a statement that clearly says, God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and he will have compassion on whom he will have compassion. That sounds like a good verse. Mercy is undeserved, and God, in a way that we don't deserve, shows mercy and compassion to the human race. What happens if we harden ourselves against it? Well, the next statement says, God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. These are not two groups of people. Some people he has mercy towards, and other people he hardens. I know that because I read to the end of the section, and at the end of chapter 11, this is what we read. God has concluded all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. God's intention is that when people turn against him, he then uses them as bad examples to warn other people, if you won't have me, I'm determined to use your example to have other people respond to my mercy. And so his desire is to have mercy upon all. And when people turn against him, God uses them, even in their unbelief, to bring about the manifestation of his mercy and his power and his name. And that's what happened in the story of Pharaoh. So when we come to the end of the section, we have these beautiful words, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? In other words, where did God get these wonderful ideas from? No one ever would have suggested such a thing. That God could actually take the dying words of an atheist like Voltaire and use them to promote the gospel. That God would actually use the devil to accomplish his purposes. The devil's the best evangelist we have. He doesn't mean to do it. He's just so hard on people, he drives them to Christ. More people come to Christ through the abuse of the devil than for any other reason. God will not be thwarted. You can reject his mercy, but you can't stop him from using you to accomplish his purposes. That's why Pharaoh is used as an illustration that is going to be applied to the nation of Israel and how God uses Israel in spite of themselves to accomplish his ends. Classic example is the cross. We read that the devil moved into Judas and Judas betrayed the Lord Jesus to the Jews and the Jews handed him over to the Romans and the Romans executed him. And the will of God was done. Now, God didn't make Judas betray him. The Lord Jesus pled with Judas not to do it. He gave him the sop of his eternal friendship. He said, friend, are you really going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? But when Judas did it, and when the Jews over whom Jesus wept and warned them and said, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, you'll know that I am. When he wept over them and pled with them not to do it, they went ahead anyway. And Pilate, he spoke to Pilate and said, he that has delivered me to you has committed the greater sin. When they all did what they chose to do, the will of God was done. And this is the whole history of the human race. And this is the point the Apostle Paul is making. You Roman Christians can trust in the love of God. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. And God is not willing that any should perish. 
And if people harden themselves against God, God will find a way to use their hardening to warn other people to flee from the wrath to come and will manifest his mercy around the world so that he shows mercy to whom he will show mercy. He hardens those who reject his mercy. But all along his purpose is that he might have mercy upon all. I hope these few comments have been helpful to you. A lot more could be said about the section, but just to allow your heart to worship a God who has come up with such a plan that no failure of man can thwart it. In fact, the failures of men advance the cause of the Lord. Even the intransigent of human hearts and the wicked machinations of the devil actually advance the cause of the Lord in showing mercy towards all.